it is tea time. <laughs> All rise. This time we'll call the uh, monthly meeting to order. And I'll ask that you uh, stand and we'll have the invocation by Commissioner Langley and then the pledge will be led by Commissioner Buzzio. Let us pray. Eternal God, our Father, we are grateful and thankful for the opportunity to assemble here one more time. We thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to serve your people. Now give us wisdom and guidance, God, in making wise and prudent decisions. In the matchless name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. 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 I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. At this time, I recognize anyone, any of the commissioners that has a conflict of interest that they need to disclose. Hearing none, the uh, first thing I'm going to do tonight is recognize our FEMA representative that's here. Uh, and uh, that's Mr. T.D. Kennard. And if you, if you would like to stand up and say anything and recognize the other people that are with you, that would be great. You didn't put you on a spot there. Or, or you can do it from right there, whatever you would like to do. But I understand there's three three or four people yeah, with you. I didn't plan to say anything, but uh, we're happy to be in this community. We're uh, working hard to help all of the folks that live here. And um, we have uh, quite a few more that are starting to come in. So we appreciate it. This is our intergovernmental affairs specialist here. And this is my partner from the state, Charles Trick. Thank you very much for being here and uh, trying to uh, do what you can for our citizens here in Beaufort County. All right, we're down to item number D, the approval of the agenda. Mr. Mr. Chairman? Yes. I'd like to make some uh, changes. Uh, as you know and other members of the board know, uh, Commissioner Brin uh, underwent some serious surgery last weekend. and. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, lucky to have him here today, but he has difficulty uh, sitting for any length of time. So I was wondering if we could move a couple of the items up that he has uh, extreme interest in, uh, so then he can uh, ask the board to excuse him from any further action. All okay. right. So what I'd like to do is uh, move the items for decision. Uh, the item number three, draft Beaufort County Solar Energy Facilities Ordinance. Uh, we can move that up that was so it would follow the uh, public hearing okay uh, I'd also like to move up uh, so that there's another issue um, that he has interest in and that would be the uh, request for uh, uh, item number six item number six planning board appointee the representative move that up so we can Yes, his vote on that and make any comments that he wishes. And on that one, uh, since we now have two candidates, uh, the uh, memo, the cover memo, should, language on that should be changed. It was changed. It was changed, okay. Uh, and that's it, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Any other changes to the agenda? Mr. Chairman. Yes. I would like to add to the agenda a discussion of the uh, Wilmington District Federal Court uh, subpoena having to do with illegal voting. Okay. For discussion. You want to add it under discussion? Wherever, wherever it goes, it's fine with me. Okay. Okay. It could become a decision item, but... Well, we'll move it to decision. Okay. <clears throat> Any other changes? All right. Can I get a motion to approve the uh, agenda as amended? So moved. Got a motion. Is there a second? Second. Motion and a second. All those in favor of those changes, please raise your right hand. Thank you. 
All right. At this time, we're going to go into our first public hearing, and I need a motion to move into the public hearing. So moved. Got a motion to move into the uh, public hearing. Is there a second? Second. All right. Second. All those in favor of that, please raise your right hand. Okay. Any opposed? All right. Uh, Kevin? Is Kevin here? Oh, sorry. Actually, Martin's in. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry, Kevin. It does have, it does have Kevin. Yes, Same I'm sorry. Um, Kevin's actually under the weather. All right. Yeah, Kevin is under the weather, so you, you have me tonight. Uh, <laughs> good evening, Mr. Chairman and County Commissioners. This public hearing is to receive comments on the closeout of the 2016 CDBG Fellows Grant Program. On July 25th, 2016, Beaufort County received a CDBG Fellows Grant to assist Beaufort County and its municipalities in developing capacity to assist its citizens by adding training to support professional development for local government professionals. Beaufort County government employees attended 17 training programs, representative from the City of Washington 2, Pantego 1, Bellhaven 1, Chuckawinity 1 and Aurora also attended uh, one training session. In total, 23 local government representatives received training under this program. This included a mayor, town councilman, town manager and local government employees. The project was funded 100% by Community Development Block Grant funds, uh, $43,309.67 was spent on the capacity building and the remaining $6,900. Sorry, $6,690.33 will be de-obligated. Um, after the public hearing, we need a motion to close out the grant and authorize authorization for the chairman to sign the closeout documents. Is there any public citizen uh, here that would like to speak on this? Uh, no one signed up for it, but we have time if anybody would like to speak. All right, we need a motion to come out of the uh, public hearing. So moved. Motion, is there a second? Second. And a second. All those in favor of coming out of this hearing, raise your right hand. All right, thank you, Mark. Is that enough for the motion to sign the document? Actually, and, and, and they're seeking a motion also to close out the, the grant and allow the chairman. I think it's an agenda item. Yep, you're right, my apologies. There's agenda item Number later. two. I'm sorry. Mark. Thank you. All right, we're going to uh, need a motion. Did we have a motion to go into the next public hearing? Yeah. All right, need a motion to go into the uh, public hearing on solar uh, energy facilities. So moved. Got a motion. Is there a second? Second. All right, motion and second. All those in favor of going into the public hearing, raise your right hand. All right, at this time, I'll recognize uh, Jamie Heath. And Jamie is our county planner. Good evening. Um, so a public hearing was advertised in the Washington Daily News on September 21st and September 28th. And the draft Beaufort County Solar Energy Facilities Ordinance has been posted on the county website for public review since sep September 21st. Um, prior to receiving public comments, I'm going to go through a brief PowerPoint to summarize the ordinance. So again, this is the draft Beaufort County Solar Energy Facilities Ordinance. Um, just to briefly touch on sections one through five, section one is um, current local ordinance repealed and states that the Beaufort County Solar Farm Setbacks Ordinance, which was adopted on September 9th, 2013, is hereby repealed in its entirety and replaced with this ordinance. Jamie, excuse yes. me. Do you mind cutting that light off, that switch right there? Thank you. Section two is purpose, section three authority, section four permit required states that the ordinance applies to all areas of Beaufort County except those lands lying within the jurisdiction of any municipality and states that solar energy facilities must obtain a development permit from the planning dep department prior to apl applying for building permits. Section five is definitions. 
section six so let's spend a bit of time on that's the permit requirements 6.1 states before a building permit may be submitted for a solar energy facility a solar energy facility development permit must first be approved by the planning board um, and that's a change from the previous ordinance which did not require planning board approval um, in the previous ordinance the approval was done at the administrative or at the staff level um, section 6.2 permit application um, reviews what is um, required in the application package 6.2 a requires a narrative overview of the solar energy facility including its generating capacity 6.2 B requires an inventory which is a tabulation describing the number specifications and type of each proposed solar array including their generating capacity dimensions and respective manufacturers and details on accessory buildings and accessory equipment um, this is a new requirement the previous ordinance did not request details on the type of equipment that was used continuing with the permit um, requirements um, 6.2 C requires a vicinity map 6.2 D requires a site plan which should include um, the planned location of each solar array all property lines within 300 feet setbacks and separation distances from protected buildings access road and turnout locations substations and accessory equipment electrical cabling and associated transmission lines the location of any underground power lines conservation areas the location and width of driveways and private roads and a landscaping and fencing plan um, and the previous ordinance did require a site plan but this um, is requiring more details on the location of the equipment within the Im improved area than the previous ordinance required 6.2 e miscellaneous the applicant shall provide the following to the planning board one a certification that the proposal is for an international electrical congress solar array that is designed to meet all north carolina building codes that's a new requirement in this ordinance and a certification that the solar arrays pass the environmental protection agency's toxicity characteristic leaching procedure or tlcp test that's also a new requirement signed copies of all original leases easements and agreements for the solar energy facility copies of any required state and federal permits licenses etc and other relevant studies reports certifications and approvals as may be reasonably requested by the planning board 6.2 f requires a maintenance plan and that should detail procedures for equipment inspections and maintenance fence maintenance landscaping maintenance and road maintenance and on um, that maintenance plan is a new requirement with this ordinance abandonment and decommissioning plan um, section 6.3 g1 is abandonment a solar energy facility that ceases to produce energy for 12 months is considered abandoned the solar energy facility owner is responsible for removing all equipment and facilities and restoring the parcel to its condition prior to development of the solar energy facility and um, this abandonment section is also in the current ordinance but it really had no follow-up requirements to assist with enforcement which is where um, number two and three come in so 6.3 g2 decommissioning plan um, the decommissioning plan should include the anticipated life of the solar energy facility define conditions upon which decommissioning will be initiated plan for removal of all non-utility owned equipment conduits structures fencing solar panels roads and foundations and restoration of the property to a condition prior to development of the solar energy facility and that decommissioning plan is a new requirement and um, 6.3 g three the performance guarantee the applicant must provide the county with a form of surety equal to 125 percent of the entire cost of decommissioning under the plan as estimated by a North Carolina licensed engineer under seal and that is also a new requirement in section 7 design standards also want to um, spend a few minutes on that um, 7.1 is the setback and separation requirements the fence which secures the solar energy facilities improved areas shall be set back at least 100 feet from all property lines and public rights of way the current ordinance requires a 50 foot setback from all property lines and rights of way so that um, doubles that required setback and um, also the solar arrays and other equipment shall be set back at least 25 feet from the interior fence line of the solar energy facility and that is a new requirement 
Solar energy facilities shall be separated by a minimum distance of 300 feet from all residential, commercial, and in institutional buildings, with the exception of accessory buildings such as sto storage sheds. Um, we did include an option for a waiver from all or part of that separation requirement if the owner of the protected building agrees to that, but the primary setback requirements would still apply even if a, wa a waiver were granted. Um, and the change from the current ordinance, the current ordinance requires a 100-foot setback from any business or residential structure. So what we're requiring now is three times what the current ordinance requires. And um, just for clarity and note that um, the minimum setbacks for a solar energy facility shall be measured from the required fence of the facility. <coughs> Section 7.2 is fencing. A fence is required around the entire perimeter of the solar energy facility to secure its improved areas. The location of the fence is determined by the required setback and separation requirements. All solar arrays and other equipment must be located inside the fence. The fence must be a minimum of six feet in height and shall be constructed of chain link. Angled barbed wire shall run along the top of the fence for the entire perimeter of the fence for security, and the gate for ingress and egress must be locked for security. Um, and that is a new requirement. The previous ordinance didn't address fencing. In section 7.3, vegetative buffer. A vegetative buffer shall be installed in front of the fence within the required setback of the solar energy facility for the entire perimeter of the solar energy facility. The previous ordinance required a vegetative buffer um, only adjacent to residential and commercial structures that were within 100 feet of the solar energy facility, but not around the entire perimeter, and it required a 70-foot length buffer for each of those um, structures. But um, again, with the new ordinance, we're now re requiring it around the entire perimeter of the facility. Um, the vegetative buffer shall consist of a row of evergreen bushes, which is the same as the previous ordinance planted no more than eight feet apart. Um, the previous ordinance required 10 feet apart. And um, the uh, bushes shall be at least six feet tall at the time of planting and will reach a minimum height of 15 feet within three years of planting um, compared to the previous ordinance, which required four feet tall at the time of planting and will reach a minimum height of six feet within five years of planting. Continuing with the um, vegetative buffer, um, must provide full screening from two feet above ground level to the required 15 foot height and bushes must grow to a minimum of eight foot in width at the base or the spacing between bushes must be reduced. Those are new requirements that were added to ensure full screening for that vegetative buffer. Um, and where adequate vegetative screening exists on the parcel where the solar energy facility is located, the existing vegetative buffer may be used with the approval of the planning board. And the vegetative buffer must be maintained, including keeping vegetation healthy, neat, and orderly in appearance, and free of litter and debris, um, as it was in the previous ordinance as well. 7.4 ground cover soil with adequate vegetative cover must be maintained under and around the panels in order to reduce runoff and erosion native grasses and wildflowers are encouraged and the ordinance refers to the North Carolina Wildlife Commission's publication recommendations for establishing native pollinator habitat on solar farms in North Carolina um, and this is a new requirement ground cover was not um, addressed in the previous ordinance 7.5 environmental impacts solar energy facilities must meet all requirements of the state and federal government and provide copies of all state and federal permits including but not limited to the stormwater permit and erosion and sedimentation control permits from the north carolina department of environmental quality the certificate of public convenience and necessity from the north carolina utilities commission and the section 404 wetlands permit from the u.s army corps of engineers where applicable Section 7.6 is roads. The minimum right-of-way width of private roads and driveways serving the solar energy facility shall be 50 feet. Private roads and driveways shall be constructed to meet all of the North Carolina DOT's standards, <coughs> design standards except for applying crushed stone for paving. A driveway permit must be obtained from NCDOT and a copy must be provided. The solar energy facility owner shall be responsible for road maintenance, including keeping roads and driveways serving the solar energy facility graded, free of potholes, and passable in all weather. Um, and this is a new requirement. The previous ordinance did not address the roads. 
7.7 lighting and electrical emissions the design and construction of solar energy facilities shall not produce light emissions that would interfere with pilot vision and or traffic control operations 7.8 power lines on-site power lines between solar panels and inverters shall be placed underground and must meet all requirements of the North Carolina electrical code 7.9 solar panel height the height of solar panels shall not exceed the height of the required vegetative buffer, and that is a new requirement. Um, and that's all for Section 7. Um, section 8 is solar energy facility permit fees. A non-refundable application fee of $500 shall be submitted with each application for a solar energy facility development permit. Um, and that is a, a, a new fee. The previous ordinance did not require an application fee. Section 9, Planning Board Decision. 9.1, Public Hearing. Input of local citizens shall be solicited by the Planning Board in at least one public hearing. 9.2, Approval. All requirements of the ordinance must be satisfied and the Planning Board um, decides on approval based on majority vote. 9.3, Expiration of Approval. Approval expires if construction has not begun within 365 days. Approval automatically expires if there are changes in ownership, cessation of the corporation or partnership, or a transfer to another person. In this case, the new owner has 60 days to submit a new permit application. Um, and this is a new requirement. Um, as I mentioned, the previous ordinance had staff level approval. It didn't go to the planning board. Um, there was no public hearing required and no um, new application was needed in the event of an ownership change. <coughs> and just briefly touching on sections 10 to 15. Section 10 is appeals. Appeals from the planning board decision go to the Beaufort County Board of Commissioners. If they wanted to appeal further than that, it would go to the state Supreme Court. Section 11, variances. Variance may be auth variances may be authorized by the planning board only if the North Carolina general statutes criteria is satisfied, which is difficult to do. Um, and the most important point of proof is that the hardship must be related to a condition peculiar to the property involved. Section 12 is enforcement penalties and remedies for violations. Uh, most notable thing there is that the fine for violation of the ordinance is $500 per day of violation. Section 13 is applicability, section 14, severability, and the final section 15 is adoption. And that's all I have. I want to go to public hearing. Thank you. Uh, we have uh, two people, and I'm sure there may be other people in the room that uh, would like to speak. The uh, first one I have is uh, Philip Madry. Is, is there anyone in the hallway? If there is, see if it's Philip. Okay. The uh, second one I have on here is uh, Keith Kidwell. Keith? And I'll, I'll ask you to keep your comments to three minutes. All, the, all these rules. Pardon? <laughs> all these rules. <laughs> uh, good evening, Mr. Commissioners. I appreciate the opportunity to speak to you this evening on the uh, solar energy facilities in Beaufort County. I do commend you. Uh, on the work that you've done to protect the property rights, uh, not only of the landowners of the facilities, but also of the surrounding properties. It's very important that we keep that in mind as we build these facilities. I think that what you've done here uh, does a fine job of, of encompassing and protecting those rights, both from both of their perspectives. So thank you very much for that. Um, I really want to speak this evening uh, to you and to the general public as we look at these solar facilities throughout Beaufort County. I just spent uh, a good portion of my summer going cross country camping with my grandchildren and one of the things we noted is the solar and wind facilities and the damage done aesthetically uh, to our environment. It's, it's just absolutely amazing how horrible these things look. People talk about the oil facilities, I passed a lot of those as well. None of them was as unattractive as the solar and wind facilities. So. Uh, what you've done is, is wonderful in protecting that type of a situation here in Beaufort County. The other thing I want to bring out is a point that we do need to do something with our energy. If you go out and read reports, and with only three minutes I can't get really into a lot of detail, but there are literally hundreds of reports that show solar and wind are not going to solve our energy problem in the future. They won't even come close. Part of that is due to the fact they don't work well when it's either not windy or not sunny. 
the other part of it is, is the facilities don't last as long as the nuclear and gas facilities do. Those typically have a 40-year life. Most of the solar will tell you they're going to produce for 25. In fact, most of the equipment is only good for about 12 to 15 years. So when they project their ROI, return on investment, you're not going to see it because you're going to have to start replacing panels and replacing equipment and windmills in a much shorter period of time where you don't do that with the gas and coal and nuclear facilities. They also, when you build these facilities, particularly the, the solar uh, photovoltaic, most of those components that, that are chemical parts of it are coming out of China. When they manufacture those, they produce radiation. When they put those on the property, there are off-leads off of chemicals there that are cancerous, and people say that that's a clean energy. I don't find that to be a clean energy. The cost of it can run as much as 25 percent of, uh, I'm sorry, 25 times higher than what we do in our traditional methods of processing and creating electricity through either the, the uh, traditional uh, gas or the nuclear projects that we do mostly here in North Carolina. So the cost isn't there. It's truly not that, that clean energy that everybody wants to call it, okay? I'll, I'll end this by pointing out, if solar and wind were really that good, we would not have to have state tax credits, county tax credits, federal tax credits, federal grants, and a federal requirement that that energy be purchased at a much higher rate than what we can produce it, and that the energy companies must buy it at that rate. We don't have to do all that to a good uh, product. It's only when the product is going to fail on its own, because solar and wind would definitely fail without all the government subsidies. So who's paying for that? We are, the taxpayers of this, of this county. We pay through it, for it by higher taxes and higher energy costs. If you want more information, send me an email on it. Thank you. Thank you, Keith. Is there anyone else? If, if you will introduce yourself, I think most of the commissioners know, but <laughs> the audience. Um, Christina Beasley, and I don't have anything written. I just wanted to say thank you guys for listening to um, the citizens of Beaufort County and taking this past 11 months or 12 months and really working so hard and um, listening to us over and over and over again to protect the people of Beaufort County. And um, this is an amazing county. We have a lot of resources. And so thank you for listening. And um, I'm really impressed with the new ordinance. So thank you. Thank you. Do we have any other citizen? Please introduce yourself even though you don't need an introduction. <laughs> My name is Doris Moat. Um, I commend you also for the new ordinance. I see a lot of changes that I think are really good for the county. Uh, I have one question. Oh, and I wanted to also say that I think it's big improvement over what we had before, which is <coughs> near to nothing. I like the vegetative buffer that you're requiring. I wanted to ask, uh, somewhere in this, I think it was Section 6, uh, she spoke about uh, if property sold with during the, the term before the permit was issued, there had to be some things done. Let's say somebody sold the property after the facility is installed, or is there a requirement for changing and getting a new permit, or how's that going to work? Do you understand what I'm saying? Or yes. Am I yes. Okay? Somebody could tell me that, I'd be happy, yeah. and I'll sit down. <laughs> All right. Is do you have anything else to say no, on that it. question? That's it. That's Jamie, it. Jamie, thank you, you. Or or the, any of the committee members was that addressed? I'm, I'm assuming it's, it's addressed. I may, I may have missed it, but I okay. could. That, that was actually meant if the company that owns the solar energy facility changes hands, not if the not property, the property that owner. it's located on. I misunderstood. Thank so there, you. That, that, there's a lease that Makes goes with that, right. with that um, contract. Thank you. Is there any other citizen before we close this? I'd like to speak. Okay. I'm going to go to the stand to speak because I think what I have to say is important. People should think about it. I, my position on solar power is overall it is a bad thing. Politicians have gotten us into this mess, but it's difficult to not to deny the citizens of Beaufort County the opportunity to get a very high rent on their land. But there's some things that we need to think about. This ordinance has not been in front of the commissioners to be marked up. And my book says there's going to be a vote on it tonight. 
So my question to the commissioners, and you don't have to answer it now because we'll get into it later on, are we going to go through this ordinance and mark it up as we traditionally do on any ordinance that comes in front of us where we go line by line and we go through the ordinance because there are a lot of things in here that are really bad. Uh, it's good that we have more uh, regulations, but there are provisions of this ordinance that are going to be bad. The second thing is the more restrictive that we make these ordinances to control industry in this county, the more we hurt ourselves with industries that are looking at coming into the county. And if you think for one minute industries don't know what the reputation of these various counties are, so far as regulation and being able to get along, you're wrong. And this is a very restrictive ordinance, and it's going to hurt even more our ability to recruit industry into this county. The second uh, thing has to do with the more things you put in this ordinance to be enforced, and, and the planner can't enforce all of this stuff. There's a lot of stuff in here you're going to have to go hire consultants and experts to do. The more restrictive this ordinance is, and the more items that are in here, the more it's going to cost the county to review permits and to do things within the ordinance. And you need, you need to think about that, too. We need, we need an awful lot of simplicity uh, to make this thing work. It is too complex, it is too technical, and it is too complicated. Thank you. Any anyone else that would? <clears throat> Myra, will you introduce yourself? Well, Myra Beasley. Um, as a resident and a property owner in Beaufort County, I would like to commend the commissioners for the effort they have put forward into the um, new ordinance. I know that it required a lot of um, meetings. I know there were several meetings with experts that y'all met with, and I appreciate the time and effort. Um, I feel like that it is uh, very good compared to where we were. I'm very thankful that we have this, and I'm a little concerned on the businesses that Mr. Richardson was referring to. Um, I, I, I can't imagine what industry maybe would be affected by the solar ordinance. But um, I do, again, thank you and appreciate the time that y'all put forth. Thank you. I think that's Philip Madry standing there at that window. If you will, open that door. You're just in time. Are you... you Okay. Do you? We're getting ready to close it, but you're entitled if you want to say anything, Philip. I don't know what's been said, but it seems like there's an anti-solar panel. In, inter, introduce oh. yourself, and you have three minutes. Three minutes. I'm Philip Madry. I'm a property owner in Beaufort County. I've lived in Beaufort County since 1969. <coughs> but uh, it seems like me that did. For somebody to tell somebody what they can do with their property after they've worked hard to pay for it, they've paid taxes on all those years, and someone comes along and tells them they can't do certain things with it. Uh, I think it's un unfair to the property owner. I think that property rights have been trampled if, if they do put restrictions on it. And that, that's all I've got to say. Okay. All right. Thank you, Phil. Is there anyone else? If not, Mr. Chairman, I, I have some comments. Well, you want to save those because we're going right into the vote. Okay, I'll save them. Okay. <clears throat> All right. I'll entertain a motion to close the public hearing. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Okay, we got a motion and a second. All those in favor, raise your right hand. All right. Jamie, just be available uh, at this time we'll uh, entertain a, a motion to approve mr. chairman let me interrupt you there this is highly irregular this was put together by a three-man committee and it was dumped on the rest of the board a week ago and no one has had time to review and mark up this ordinance we, this board has never done business this way in the past. This is a cram down. If you vote on this tonight, there, there are issues in this ordinance that are illegal. There are issues in this ordinance that's going to cost the county a lot of money to enforce. So this ordinance needs to be gone through. 
by this board and marked up. I have comments on about every page in here. Okay. It, it, it's my understanding that uh, if we do not have a unanimous vote tonight, we will have a second public hearing in November. Is that second vote? You don't have to have second you, vote. You would have to have a second vote. Statute requires that any anything that's of an ordinance in nature requires a unanimous vote by a board of commissioners, and without a unanimous vote, it has to come back for a second reading. But the point is being missed here, that someone is walking in the door with an item and says, vote on this, and we don't, you don't know what you're voting on. That, I'm, I'm going to tell you that right now. This is another one of those things like went on in Washington, D.C. We're going to vote on it, and then we're going to read it after we vote on it. We have never done an ordinance of any kind in Beaufort County without the entire board reviewing the ordinance and marking it up, and then it is brought back because there are changes to be made in this ordinance. This is an oppressive ordinance. You're going to have a few lawsuits out of this ordinance if you adopt it, too. All of that can be avoided, and you can still have essentially what you want. But a cram down like this, we've never, I've been on this board 22 years, we have never done this. Would any of the committee members or our general counsel want to speak to any of the comments any of the committee members mr chairman yes uh the intention of the subcommittee was to recommend an ordinance that uh and i'll quote something that uh mr kidwell stated was to protect the rights of the uh, property owners uh, both the individual that wants to lease their land or sell their land to a solar energy facility and also to protect the rights of the individuals that are near or next to a solar energy facility and this ordinance does that this ordinance does not prohibit a landowner from selling their land to a solar energy facility or to lease their land to a solar energy facility the $500 fee which we never had a fee before it's been costing the county when we have one of these applications, at least $500. We're not making a profit on it. We're charging the applicant what it actually cost us. The planning board, the review, the public hearing. And the other thing we're giving is a public hearing to any property owner in the county that is impacted by one of these solar energy facilities, which is never in there before. The other thing the other ordinance had is that if an individual in this county leases their land to a solar energy facility and in five years, 10 years, 20 years, you can't find a solar energy facility, the landowner had to clean the property. And a 600 acre solar farm would probably cost the landowner at least a million dollars to clean it up. And if that person disappeared, the taxpayer in the county would have to pay that million dollars. And I'm going by today's prices. So the decommissioning plan was put that in there, again, to protect the landowner and the taxpayer of the county, not to stop a solar energy facility. Anybody can come in and put one up as long as they meet the requirements. The design standard, where we put a setback, the last one was 50 feet, so we made it 100 feet, but 300 feet from the nearest uh, design or, or a property owner building a residential commercial institutional <laughs> the other thing is the solar panels we are uh, we're kind of regist vegetative barrier and that's to beautification if we want to go down every highway in this county because we got an out off of land and see nothing but panel after panel after panel they're getting ready to build one in Virginia which is 15 square miles how many acres that is 15 square miles. They have no ordinance. No ordinance whatsoever. So we put in vegetative covering for it. You know, these solar energy facilities get an awful lot of money, as Mr. Kidwell stated. Mm -hmm. We have to give them tax write-offs. <clears throat> Last year, it cost you, the taxpayer, $543,000. When they get built, done building the 600-acre one, it's going to cost us at least another million dollars, possibly and tax losses 
But we're not stopping it. We never said you can't build it. All we're saying to the, the residents who want to lease their land or sell their land or the solar energy facility. Now, if you lease your land or sell your land, the solar energy facility is the one who's to do all these things. And it's not going to stop them because of the money that they're making from taxes, your taxes, federal taxes, state taxes, county taxes. And a lot of these, some of these facilities were built in land that can't even support it because they don't have any sun hardly. But it's because of the tax writers. But here we have a lot of sun, we have a lot of power lines. Um, so those are some of the things that we did. Now in enforcing it, can the planning board enforce this? I don't see any reason why the planning department and the planning board couldn't enforce the ordinance. So all we're talking yeah, about is shrubs, yes. fencing, solar arrays, which we limit to under 15 feet. Most of them, if you go around, are built about 8 to 10 feet high. So you could, you could look at land, you could look at the permits or the applications, how high the solar facility things are, whether it's, it meets EPA requirements. Mr. Kidwell also mentioned the toxicity of these things. Some of these coming out of China have fluorochemicals in them. Fluorochemicals leach to Gen X. There's a lot of information now being prepared by Gen X. EPA is beginning to look at Gen X because it can contaminate the water in this county. Because they've had contamination in other parts, other parts of the state, in other states in this country. So is everything you could, your office can enforce it? Yes. And we did have the county attorney um, review the ordinance for legal requirements as well. Mm -hmm. Mr. Chairman. So there's very few differences between the old one and the new one. Yeah, Commissioner Brand. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I uh, just wanted to say that uh, this three-man committee that put this ordinance together worked long and hard at these meetings and at home and looking at, at uh, at different ordinances throughout the county surrounding areas and, and we don't have anything in our ordinance that's not somewhere in these other ordinances so there's nothing illegal about it and my main idea for the for having this ordinance in place is just like mr kidwell said just like mr buzzo said was to protect both sides of the property owner because I thought that was the most important thing. And we, we ain't never going to make everybody happy. Don't even try. But I think we, we accomplished what we, we set out to do. And I'd just like to say to Jamie how hard she's worked on this, making sure we made the right moves. And because us three was at an impasse, so to speak, with, with all this information that we had in front of us. And, and we were kind of marking time. So Jamie steps in and in two weeks she had everything put in place and took all the information that, that we had gave her and put it, put it together in the ordinance. And, uh, and it was, it was a, a beautiful thing to watch it all come together. Thank you. And you could also say there's a lot of compromising between the three of us. Yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> any any other commissioner well, commissioner evans uh i was not on the committee but i came in and sat and and again i, I watched them go through the system and what we had a year ago to compare to what we have now i think we have a, a good system and again um i think everything is covered on it uh again a big issue with property rights we think that's i think that's very important so from where we were to what we have now, I think we've got a workable system. We can sit here and play with it for three more years and spend a lot more money and change a word here and a word there. I think we can um, kind of clean this thing up maybe down the road. But right now, I think we have a, a nice, good working document that uh, we can move forward with. Well, I served, on, I served on the committee, and some of the things in here that I totally don't agree with, agree with. I believe in people having their property rights. But in saying that, after I looked at the surrounding counties and see what they were doing, I knew that Beaufort County had to do something. And that's the reason I made that decision that I would support this, this uh, ordinance. It's not perfect, but it's better than what we had. Thank you. Well. I don't have a problem with it per se, but I, I'm, I'm kind of leaning with, with uh, Commissioner Richardson. I, I think we need to look at it 
and and that is the way I'm going to vote. I'm, I'm not going to say I'm, I'm going to vote against it in November, but I want to look at it, and uh, I'll let you know next month. Okay. Mr. Chairman. Yes. I want to point a point of order. All right. Once you vote on this thing tonight, you don't have an opportunity to change it. The procedure is that you take the document that's been reviewed and you vote on that document. The second vote is voting on the same document again. If you change it between now and November, then you have to start over again with the procedure. The procedure has always been on an ordinance like this, it's about 20 pages long, is that you don't dump it on me a week before the board meeting because that's a cram down. And then the board sits down and the board reviews the document and agrees on the language in the document so that you can go forward with the document. I'll give you one example of gross excess. Uh, two things. Number one, on a 600 acre farm, that owner is going to collect about a million dollars a year. So if he has to clean it up and it cost him a million dollars and it's been there 10 years, he's still doing okay. That's the risk of doing business. It's not up to the government to step into that. And this whole thing is driven by a family squabble up at Terracilla, just so you will know. That's what this thing is driven by, because part of the family is getting the money and the rest of them are not. And that's driving this, just so everybody knows. <clears throat> now, if you have a 600-acre piece of ground, 640 acres is a, is a mile square. Now, why do you need to have a 100-foot setback on the back of this that joins another piece of farmland? And you're going to come off of it 100 feet, and then you've got to plant a row of trees where nobody is? That does not make sense. There's a lot of impracticalities in this. The burden is put on this, saying to the developer, stay out of Beaufort County. Don't come to Beaufort County because we don't want you here. And my problem with all of this is that spills over to other people that want to come to Beaufort County to do business. It affects our reputation, and people are not going to come here when you have this kind of stuff going on where we're going to pick winners and losers, and we don't put together an ordinance to accomplish the basic things, which is whatever protections that you and your subjective opinion think that you want to impose on the public, uh, they're not going to come here because we can be subjective and we can go on with stuff like this forever. And we're, we're shooting ourselves in the foot again. Beaufort County does a fantastic job of that. And you're doing it again because you're letting some people in the county who are squabbling among themselves uh, uh, get, uh, direct an ordinance that's going to hurt you. And we don't need this without it being reviewed. The, the bad things can be taken out of this ordinance like requiring three miles on a 640-acre piece of land of trees to be planted that are not necessary to be planted. And if the property runs up against another farm where they're farming, tell me that farmer sitting over there driving that tractor is going to be concerned about the aesthetic view on the piece of property next door. The answer is he is not. So we need to, we need to use our standard procedure, and I, I have a severe objection to this ordinance not being reviewed line by line and written up and, and uh, uh, addressed by this board because we have never done a cram down since I have been on this board like this. Would it, would it be agreeable to having a separate working session to address any potential changes? I don't, I don't have a problem with that. I mean, it, it, I mean we had everyone had a chance to read it i mean if they want to make some changes i mean because one i mean one person might want to change it but it take a majority to change it one person just can't change it it take a majority so i don't have a problem if we delay it let them draw it up cross it up read it up anything they want to do with it i don't have a problem with them having time to review it um, mr chairman first of all two of the things that said there is a waiver provision that the landowner next to this it went on least it for the 300 foot separation yeah. requirement yeah. from residential and the other thing is if you have an existing vegetative barrier on one side like a tree line or something you don't have to put up the that's right vegetation thing if it's so on the waiver is already in the, in the thing for the two things that commissioner richardson talked about 
No, I, I, let me correct you on that. The waiver is only for a residence. It's not a, uh, there's not a provision in here that the adjoining property owner can do a waiver on that three miles of fencing and trees. It's only for a residence. It's for a residential, commercial, or institutional building. It's for the separation requirement from those buildings, but that does not affect the 100-foot separation requirement from the property line. Which is double what it is now. It's 50 on the current. It's 100 on the, uh, the new one. Well, and, you know, and this wildflower requirement should be a suggestion and not a requirement. Uh, but one of the most expensive things you can do in reclamation work is to go out and start buying. I do this, so I know. You know, it's not a matter of, of, of talking about something he doesn't know about. It's when you have to go and start buying plants, natural plants somewhere, and planting them and keeping them alive. And when you have to find somebody that can sell you wildflower seeds that are natural, you, you've got a problem. This gets to be a very expensive thing. And these are the kinds of things that I'm concerned about in this ordinance. We don't have any problem growing grass in Beaufort County. As a matter of fact, we got a problem killing grass and getting rid of it in Beaufort County. So why do we need all of these kinds of specialty items in here that are put in here just to restrict uh, and make more expensive on solar farms? Now, keep in mind, solar, solar farms are not good from the standpoint of the politicians in Raleigh and Washington that have taken the money to give people what they want. But we're talking about people in Beaufort County that have an opportunity to make money out of this, more money than they can make farming. At our, at our, na excuse me, at our national meeting in Nashville, Tennessee, I know that uh, our manager and I think Commissioner Brin, myself, and Commissioner Evans uh, sat in on a national discussion that addresses pretty much everything that's in our ordinance. Uh, so, I mean, it pretty well patterns just about everything that's happening in 50 states. I'd like to make a brief comment of clarification, if I can. The requirement was that they have ground cover to reduce soil erosion. The wildflowers and native grasses was a suggestion, and we refer them to the North Carolina Wild <coughs> publication if they want to go that route and try to be more environmentally friendly but that part was a suggestion the only requirement was for some kind of ground cover which could be standard grass or whatever is mm -hmm. is there anything in here that cannot be waived by the board of commissioners as it relates to the ordinance i mean if we waived? if we have a project that comes in and let's just say it's on a farm that's got four thousand acres and there's a road that goes back and it's on the back of the farm uh, and you know a mile or half a mile from any any building or anything can can the planning board not ask us to waive any kind of requirements no um, any everybody would have to meet the requirements of the ordinance if they wanted a waiver from any requirements of the ordinance they'd have to apply for a variance and that would go to the planning board for approval but there's very strict guidelines from the state statutes that the applicant has to prove to be granted a variance from the sure. ordinance um, one of those being that they have to have a peculiar situation okay. with the land involved that prevents them from meeting the requirements of the ordinance so no we would really have to treat everybody the same unless they were able to pass that that test that um, to get a variance approved okay Commissioner the, Evans you know, I don't I don't see how they can approve one set of guidelines and then somebody meets those guidelines and then two years later another solar farm comes in and we'd say he wants to make some some changes to it. So no, no, no. Here's the ordinance. I think once we get that ordinance started, we put them out need to leave it in place unless there's some real big issue. Mr. Uh, Chairman, what so what you're talking about, where 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 we can waive some of this stuff? Now we're slipping over into the good buddy system. If we don't <laughs> like you, you got to follow the ordinance. <laughs> But if you're a good buddy, we're going to make an exception for me. I don't like that. That's offensive to me. And I want to say one more thing about what you're talking about on a waiver. You need to read the language in here that when it comes to the commissioners about what we can do, that is unusually restrictive language that puts the commissioners in a box as to what we can do. We can't do any of that stuff. It's, right. it's, I haven't seen language like that before. This thing needs to be reviewed before you vote on it all right i'm gonna i'm gonna ask if there is a motion to approve to approve this 
I have a motion that we, we put up a uh, session, a work session, and that the commissioners review this line by line and we uh, come to a final document before we vote on it. All right, we have a motion on the floor. Is there a second? I second. All right, we have a second. Any discussion before we take a vote? All right, all those in favor of the motion, raise your right hand. Those opposed? Two five. All right. Now, I'll entertain the motion I'll to. Motion. Okay, we got a motion to approve. Is there a second? <coughs> All right. We have a second. All those in favor of the no, motion? No, we got discussion. All right. Well, you have to have discussion after the second, Mr. Chairman. You All know right. that. Well, go you're ahead. trying to do your cram down, is what you're trying to do. Go ahead. Now, and what I'm saying to you before we vote is this is a cram down. We have never had somebody walk in with something like Nancy Pelosi said in Washington, vote for it and you can read it next week. And that's what you're doing here because these guys that are voting for this don't understand what's in here. They don't understand what it means. I'm in the regulatory business. I do regulatory every day. This is an awful document. It's going to smear the reputation of this county. It's going to blacken the reputation of this county. Because what these people admitted they did was we took what was in everybody's ordinance, we added it all up, and we put it into one ordinance. That is not good common sense. And that's that not is not thinking. That's not that is what you said. That's that's not not that is what you said. I heard you. I was here. We don't need to argue about that. All right. I finished. Well, you hear okay. what you want to hear. Anybody else? Any other discussion? All right. All those in favor of the motion, raise your right hand. Those opposed. Vote was five to two. Thank you, Jamie. Thank you. And, and Mr. Chairman, if I may, uh, as, as uh, Commissioner Brent said earlier, Jamie did a wonderful job. Thank you, sir. I've never seen anything uh, that comes close to this. So, really did a nice job. Thank you. I appreciate that. You, <laughs> Thank you. All right. To accommodate uh, Commissioner Brent. Uh, we move into item number six, the planning board appointee, uh, Katie. Yes, sir. We currently have an opening on the opening planning board for a representative from that. And we do have two people that are interested in, the, um, in that position, Mr. LaCava um, and Mr. Pilot, Jr. And it's up to your consideration to choose one of those or give more time and see <clears throat> okay, if I remember correctly, our procedure when we did the college board and we had two nominees, uh, we asked for both of them to be a nomination and then we took a vote. Yes, sir. Okay. Mr. Chairman. Yes. I um, like to nominate Mr. Pylon. Okay, this does not require a second. All Mr. Right. Chairman. Yes. Uh, now we're going to have some discussion after this, right? Yes. Oh, okay. I nominate John LaCava. All right. I'm here to speak. Okay. I, you're, you're down for the public comment. Yes. Yes. All right. Speak. Any discussion? Yeah, there's discussion. All right. Well, let me tell the public how this works. Uh, that position there has been open for about three years, and no one has wanted to fill it. Uh, here's how this thing works to show you how this board operates. Mr. LaCava submitted his application at the first, uh, 7th of September. On the 27th of September, the last day that you could get it in, Mr. Pilon submitted his application. Mr. Pilon is a severe political enemy of mine. People on this board went out and recruited Mr. No, Pilon. Gary, why did you move it up to the front? I've sat here with you a nobody, long time. Nobody, I know how you operate, and the more nobody, you object, the more guilty you are. Absolutely. So nobody, I just keep my mouth shut and and rather than him. looking as bad as you're looking. Yeah, right. Well, he sat down there for three or four years, and he never volunteered for this. Now, Pyland served on the hospital board, and his disservice was not distinctive at all. You would not want this man serving on a board. He is a troublemaker and his his character is in question so here we go any other comment all right uh, I'll, I'll say something on behalf of uh, uh, Mr. Pilot uh, he served on a bad planning board from 2012 to 2018 uh, and he, uh, he has uh, manufacturing and regulatory compliance experience and uh, I 
Yeah, the point is yes, they, people, the audience can't hear you. Bring your mic. Oh. Bring your mic. Uh, in looking at the applications, I see that uh, uh, Mr. Pylan uh, served on um, the Bath Planning Board from 2012 to 2018. He also has a regulatory background. So I think he's well, he would be well qualified for this disposition. Um, and I, like Gary, have not sought out anybody for this position. Any other comment? All right. All those in favor of uh, Kava, raise your right hand. All right. All those in favor of Mr. Pilot, raise your right hand. Before I get a chance to speak. Uh, yes. We're accommodating Commissioner Brand. I, now I know. Com Com Commissioner Brand has asked to be excused after. Make a motion to excuse Commissioner Brand. All right. Got a motion. Is there a second? Second. Motion on the second. All those in favor, raise your right hand. Those opposed. All right. Thank you, Commissioner Brand. Thank you. All right, we're down to public comments. And the first one on here is uh, Patricia Garrison. And if you will, introduce yourself and three minute limit. Yes, I'm Patricia Garrison. I'm with the Beaufort County Republican Party Executive Committee. During the August County Commissioner's meeting, the Republican Executive Committee presented a resolution to the board asking them to reconsider your tax increase. And I have copies here of that resolution if the board members would like to see it to refresh their memory. We are again coming before the board asking the county commissioners to reconsider the tax increases voted on by this board. The citizens of Beaufort County have experienced a devastating hurricane. Private citizens have had damage to their homes, their property, their businesses. There are many businesses that have not reopened and the date of reopening has not been established. They don't know when they're going to reopen their business. Mr. Chairman, will you present to this board a request to consider revisiting the tax increase, decreasing taxes to the rate that it was previously at prior to your July meeting when you voted to increase the taxes of the Beaufort County citizens? My second question goes to the Board of Commissioners. Will you vote to decrease taxes to relieve the burden of the tax-paying citizens that have been affected by this devastating storm? Are there any commissioners that would vote to decrease taxes? Thank you. The citizens of Beaufort County you have your answer. Thank you. All right. The next uh, person, citizen, is John Anderson. Good evening. My name is John Anderson. I'm here to speak on behalf of my nephew, Corey Anderson. Uh, thank you to the five uh, last month who voted on the request for the emergency contact policy from the sheriff and also to have it added into the county medical plan. Thank you for that. Those of you who don't know, Corey passed away 17 months ago as of October the 8th in the custody of Sheriff Coleman uh, due to a lack of medical care. Since then, we've been looking for answers to why. Why was the family uh, not called from by the sheriff's department what is the sheriff's policy on notification of emergency contacts 
when an inmate is hospitalized with a critical or serious uh, illness. Where is Corey's list of emergency contacts that he supposedly filled out when he entered into the jail? After eight months of stalling and deception by Sheriff Coleman and his department, we came to the board looking for help uh, with questions as to why. Why? There's no reason that we can't get public policy, and the family has a right to know uh, why a family member died from, from lack of medical care while in the custody of the sheriff. In February, the county attorney stated that he had been assured that we had received a copy of this policy. Not true. Uh, that's why we're still here 17 months later. The sheriff also appeared in February stating that he had policies on most everything. So if he's got policies on most everything, why don't we have the policy on uh, contacting or the notification of emergency contacts? Fast forward up to tonight. Now we know that the policy on notification can be put into the jail's medical plan uh, by the County Board of Commissioners according to the state statutes. This was voted on and passed in the last meeting by five of the seven members of the board. Uh, let's move forward uh, by the authority that you have and have this policy added as part of the medical plan now before this happens to another inmate. Uh, my brother and my family have suffered enough. Simply put, this is the right thing to do. Uh, any family who's lost a family member, I'm sure, would be requesting for the same thing to take place. It's time to put this to rest. We've had enough of politics by the sheriff and by his department. To the five of you who voted last time, again, thank you for your support. I pray that you'll support tonight when this issue comes back up. To the two of you who did not support it, uh, I pray that you'll have a change of heart and a change of mind. If not, I pray that the people of Burford County will see that you're more interested in yourself than you are the people of this county. I will not stop. I will be back until this issue is resolved and we have some closure. Thank you for your opportunity to speak tonight, and God bless you. Thank you. Yes, sir. All right, we're moving into uh, items for consent. Is there any item that... Uh, you would like to have moved to a further discussion. I'd like to know more about item one. I'm sorry. Mr. Perry, did you, were you here for public comment? Okay. I, I, I had three names and okay. he said he's not. All right. Any, any items under items for consent that you would like to have moved for discussion? I'd like to move item number one. Okay. That'll be moved for item, under items for decision. Mr. Chairman. Yes. If if at all possible, I, I don't know if Ann Ann's got some folks with her about that. If, if you could, if it's possible, I don't okay. know how long she's going to be here, but could you have that and then discuss that right afterwards? Because Ann can certainly answer yes. those questions. Yes, we can do that. We can do that. <clears throat> Any, is that the only item? That's the only one I've held. All right. Can I have a motion to, motion to approve the uh, other items for consent? Got a motion. Is there a second? Second. And a second. All those in favor of approving the uh, items for consent other than number one, raise your right hand. Those opposed? All right. And to accommodate Ann and uh, Rodney, would you, would you come up here and... Uh, address any questions that Commissioner Richardson has. Sure. Well, I just have one quick question on item number one. As I understand it, we're getting a $28,000 grant? Yes, sir. Okay. The matching funds for that grant, are there matching funds? Any of my budgeted line items, such as salaries, will cover anything that's a required match. So there's we're asking for 100 percent no money from you. There's no money from the county, no additional money from the county. Okay, that's all, that's all I have on that one. Okay, thank you. Motion to approve. All right, got a motion to approve. Second. Second. All right, second. All those in favor of the uh, motion, raise your right hand. Okay, thank you. All right, we're down to items for discussion. Uh, and the first one is the uh, Hurricane Florence recovery 
Uh, Carney. <laughs> Here again, thank you very much. We'll pay you after the meeting. I'm going to pay him right now. Uh, thank you, uh, Chairman and, and Board. Uh, Charles Tripp is the professional working the light switch tonight. And um, as we go into um, our response and the recovery phase that we're in now of Hurricane Florence, Charles is our Area 2 coordinator from the North Carolina Department of Emergency Management uh, under the De Department of uh, Public Safety. And I just want to say thank you to him publicly in front of you guys. He has been excellent in getting us set up. Uh, from the time that I have come into the county and Chris has come into the county in helping us in preparedness and uh, also in this response mode and now helping us as well going into the recovery stage. We just want to tell him thank you publicly because he's done us a great job. Um, with that, I forgot the microphone. Um, <laughs> as you take a look at, at this, we'll, we'll try to be brief in it but let you know um, you know, we, we have prepared for many things. I will say everything that Chris has come up with an idea to prepare in emergency management has happened. So uh, we're going to ask him not to throw anything else new out uh, because everything he throws, it seems like that event comes for us next. But um, when they first showed the change of this storm on the map, we hadn't seen any prior spaghetti. Um, you know, from the weather forecast to say that there was any precedent of a storm making this kind of, of rotation. So we continued to prepare for the worst. As you know, it was a Cat 4 uh, saying that was coming into our area. We were very fortunate. We, we thank God that that did not come to us in Beaufort County. We do have some damage, but nowhere near uh, what it could be. I'm going to go through this presentation um, pretty much looking at the phases of emergency management itself. Uh, before Hurricane Florence uh, got here, of course, there was preparedness. Um, we had our response, which for Beaufort County went really quick, over about 36 hours. We were probably one of the first counties with real damage to go into a recovery mode while other parts of our state were still in a response. And of course, we're still under mitigation from previous storms, but, but we'll be uh, from this storm as well. Uh, Chris and I believe very strong on the five P's, as you see up here, that we've got to have proper planning to make sure we have a plan for things that are coming so we can function under the, that plan. And this was, was a good example of putting those plans in motion. Things went really well. Um, I throw this slide up. I'm, I'm, I, I'm out of diagrams and out of space to say in the planning piece, before Hurricane Florence was here, all the way back to 2017, we started the planning process of response. And it's really all of those agencies you see up there, you see Beaufort County is a big symbol in the middle. Absolutely every department we've had in the county helped prepare for this. We had training this year that department heads went to and other members of their department in incident command system operating in the EOC and under that environment. We just had a great response from the county as a whole and even outside agencies in preparing. And uh, from that, going into the response mode itself, um, these agencies, everyone that you see up there on the board, did just an, uh, an astronomical job. I would like to say thank you to our county staff uh, from each department. Uh, all of those staffs leaving their, their primary job in the event of the emergency, being able to come in and we operate the Emergency Operations Center in the way it was handled. And if I tried to name per name, I'd be in trouble for that. So let me just say all of our staff. I would like to say a special thank you to Mark Dawn with uh, the Beaufort County Schools. Excellent to work with. Uh, he and his staff in, in every way helped us with the shelters, from feeding people in the shelters, to open shelters, the principals, the staffs and things in there. And also Jim Linson uh, with the North Carolina Forestry Service, our Beaufort County group. Um, he came in and helped us in operations, and his group set up a central receiving and distribution and did a phenomenal job with that. So I want to say thank you to all of these agencies you see and our personnel that helped with it. Chris is going to go over our response and entering into our recovery, and I'll finish with mitigation. Thank you, Director Hedgepath. So looking at the impacts that we received here in Beaufort County, as, as Director Hedgepath just mentioned, and, and we have discussed in previous meetings, we received some very favorable changes uh, in that last 36 hours as Florence approached our, our, our coast. 
you know, the Monday of that week, we were expecting a blunt force hit from a Category 4 storm. Uh, in those last 36 hours, there was a lot of answered prayers on our part and some favorable changes to Beaufort County. What that resulted in for us was about 5 to 10 inches of rain across the county, depending on where you were. Uh, we had consistently 7 to 10 feet of storm surge along the Pamlico River. Most of our county experienced sustained winds between 20 and 45 miles per hour. We did have some higher gust in places, but sustained winds uh, stayed in that 20 to 45 area. Our greatest impact was actually floodwaters, and that was to the Aurora, Bellhaven, Chacoinity, Pamlico Beach, Washington areas. Uh, there's areas that are, that are prone to those types of floodings, and that's exactly where we saw it in this case. Uh, as is the case for many of our weather events in Beaufort County, the, the river seems to be the dividing magic line for us. Uh, where in the past, whatever event that might, we might be faced weather-wise, the river has always divided us north and south in the, in the elements that we experience. And that was the case on this event as well. There was a drastic difference from what the citizens of Aurora and Blunt's Creek experienced versus what the citizens of Old Ford and Pine Town experienced. Uh, we were just fortunate in that southern track in the way the bands entered across our coast and the impacts we felt as a result of that. So in our response, as, as Director Hedgepath mentioned, we did have a full EOC activation. Um, and, and as he also mentioned, this has been a, a lot of planning and meetings with department heads over the past month, or I'm sorry, the past year. Uh, but what we found in this EOC activation is we had department heads or critical decision makers in the room at the EOC, and that was critical for us. Uh, we're going to talk about some of the challenges and busyness that we, we saw during those EOC activations, but had we not had all those individuals in our EOC as those real-time elements were happening to make real-time decisions, our outcome would have been drastically different. Uh, so just can't say enough about all the staff members who helped us in that EOC uh, component. Uh, we were operating two shelter locations, one at P.S. Jones and one at Washington High School. We did have a central distribution uh, point staff that was actually the IRB building off of Page Road. Great location, served us well during the event and continues to serve us well in the recovery phase. Uh, all of our local first responder, law enforcement, and public work staff uh, were involved at some point during our response. From an outside agency, uh, and, and meaning out beyond Beaufort County and in many cases beyond North Carolina, uh, we had an 88-member USAR team from New Jersey uh, that was staffed very heavy for water response. They had six boats and two high-wheeled vehicles, and at one point we had all of them operating in Beaufort County, really within the city of Washington at one point. We also had a 45-member water rescue team from Arizona. We had a four-ambulance strike team from Orange County, Florida. That was four, four paramedic-level ambulances and one S, uh, SUV or QRV that accompanied them. And we also had an EOC overhead team from the state that helped us in our EOC uh, functions um, locally. To give you kind of a perspective of just how busy our EOC was, uh, Friday morning about 2.30 was the start of, of what would have been the height of our response. That started with a structure fire in the Bunyan area in which several fire departments responded mutual aid. Now, uh, uh, imagine a, a full working structure fire in the heat of our hurricane elements. Uh, and and that's, what, that's what our departments were dealing with to start this morning off. As those units were working that, that particular incident, the city of Washington began to get calls for rescue in their downtown area. Uh, at that point, the, the USAR team from New Jersey and all of their water assets were dispatched to the city of Washington. The city of Washington staff coordinated that response. At one point, they were pulling out about 100 people an hour from the downtown area. All total, just the fire department, or, or accounted for 260 water rescues. That does not count what Washington PD was able to pull out on their vehicles. Uh, so this, this occurred between 2.30 and 10 o'clock that morning. Uh, when we mentioned Mark Doan and the school system and their support, uh, we actually had school buses running shuttle routes so that when the, when the fire department personnel were pulling people out of those areas, they were loaded on school buses and carried to our shelter location. 
During that same time, we had multiple water rescues from the Bellhaven area. Uh, a number of individuals were brought out using the Sheriff's Department high water vehicles as well as Bellhaven PDs. Uh, we had our second shelter opened at P.S. Jones. By 10 o'clock that Friday morning, we had 770 evacuees in our two shelters, in addition to about 200 uh, responders or staff that we had housed in some of those same buildings. We were also challenged with numerous primary roads that were divided by flooded water. Uh, our normal access down 264, for example, into Bellhaven and Pantego was restricted in several places, and we actively had deputies and ambulance EMS personnel trying to find routes around those areas predetermined in the event we had a response that we had to get people back to the hospital. Uh, at one point that morning, Bellhaven Fire Department, Pamlico Beach Fire Department, and Pantego Fire Departments had water inside their stations. Sydney Fire Department was dry but could not access any of their fire units and Washington Station 1 was evacuated. And also during this same 2.30 to 10 o'clock time frame, Beaufort Vinant Hospital reported having two generator failures at their facility. They were down to essential power only and we were actually talking about evacuations of a hospital. So when, when we say that having those critical people, those decision makers in our EOC to deal with challenges that were in real time and make real decisions. This is what happened in a matter of hours just in one of those operations period. And these are things that the public will, will barely, probably never see unless we mention it. Uh, this is how busy it was. This was the work that people were putting forth to keep everybody safe. As we move into a recovery phase, and I can run through these uh, fairly quickly, our biggest goal, uh, one, is naturally to maintain critical infrastructure. Uh, this particular challenge was, was tasked to Christina Smith, who did a, a, an outstanding job. Uh, but all power was restored to our county by, by 9.22. It was a Saturday afternoon. Our biggest holdup on that was Duke Power for some, for, uh, for some of our southern county um, pieces. Uh, our Disaster assessments were completed by our first responders. As soon as it was safe for them to get out, we started getting assessments of damaged areas and where some of those challenges might be. Our goal was to get our shelters, our people transitioned from shelters back home safely. And we were able to complete that within a few days of the storm impacting us on, on Tuesday the 18th. We established several pods throughout our recovery phase, mainly in Aurora, Bellhaven, Chocowinity, Sydney, and Washington. Those were staffed for several days before they were brought to a conclusion by request of those municipalities. We continue to coordinate our VOAD efforts through Virginia Baptist Men. Uh, they are still active in that role and still coordinating that piece for us countywide. We uh, had conversations with SDR and, and establishing or pulling the trigger on our, our debris contract um, pick up piece and removal piece. Uh, that contract is, is undergoing a FEMA evaluation to make sure that it is still compliant and we hope to have that in place uh, in the coming days. Uh, through our, our partners at FEMA and NCEM, um, we have individual and public assistance teams currently working. We have a, a disaster recovery center that's open at the Andrews building. Uh, we also have a small business administrating administration that will be setting up in that DRC uh, as well. As we look more long term, this is some of the phase pieces that we're currently moving into as a detailed damage assessment and cost analysis. We've got some very basic initial damage assessments, but dollar signs aren't attached to them. Uh, these detailed damage assessments will provide us with the numbers of what it cost uh, us to have a response, the, the values of properties that have been damaged and so forth, and that will be an ongoing process in the coming weeks. Uh, we continue to work with the COG on all of our recovery activities, and right now we have an, an initial deadline or, or, or a completion goal of debris removal for November 1st, um, and, and we look okay to, to stay on that, that point as well. So with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Director Hedgepath to talk about the mitigation phase. 
So really looking at mitigation is where we're going from here as we have the recovery center open and uh, individuals being able to seek assistance going for, for their FEMA assistance and, and great volunteer resources coming in and being able to link up with those. Um, we'll look at this total incident from all the responders, all those that helped, and that's from the, the local fire and EMS uh, to our law enforcement and, and absolutely everyone that was a part. Um, we, we saw some changes that needed to be done in our emergency operations plan before this storm actually came and we went ahead and put those in place. But we'll be evaluating to see if there's anything else we need to tweak. Um, and then looking at the properties themselves for mitigation. I, I think you guys know for sure how long a mitigation process works. We are still raising houses from Irene. You know, those, uh, those funds still coming in, the long process. Uh, but we'll be identifying new homes for mitigation, especially those homes that had repeat losses over these last storms. So we'll just keep that coordination up. Uh, we will be doing this for months, if not a couple of more years, from Hurricane Florence itself. So just a uh, brief uh, where we've been and where we are, where we hope to be, and be glad to answer any questions you may have. Charles, will you turn those lights on? Will you introduce uh, Charles again since the lights were off when you did that? Sure. <laughs> he doesn't like being introduced in the light. No. Yeah. <laughs> Charles Tripp, uh, Area 2 Coordinator with the North Carolina Department of Emergency Management and a great resource to Beaufort County. We thank, thank him. For thank it. you for being here, Charles. Uh, I did one the other day. I'll do it again. I'd like to do a big shout out uh, to Carney and Chris, the job they did. I got an opportunity to go out to the OC when the heat was really turning on and to see these guys operate, if you will, everybody in here, if we were to take and move up, this is the room they were operating, the size of the room. Everybody's got a everybody's got a cell phone. Everybody's trying to communicate emergency situations, first responders coming in, people standing outside trying but these guys pulled it off. They commanded those guys' attention. It got done. It was again another a big shout out to you guys. Y'all did one heck of a job under some very difficult situations. We'd just like to reiterate the team concept sure. of absolutely everybody in the Y'all had you had a good team. Yes we did. Thank you. Any others? Jim. Yes. Uh, the Emergency Operations Center. Um, how did that How did that facility uh, work out in the uh, during the uh, hurricane? The roof stayed on. The air condition stayed going. So that's two good things. Um, it's just the size. Um, it's the. You know, having that many people come come together in coordination, um, we tried not to even have briefings in there because because we couldn't brief and then turn back over into the center itself. Um, and and as we were moving to an operations board in the hallway, you know, there's people that are walking through when you're trying to to, to do very direct operations. Um, so so it's we need space. There's no doubt about that. Um, it was very tight. In, in what we were doing, but we did the best we could with what we had, and we, we did a good job. And and um, I would just like to, to say a special thank you. I've worked disasters in several places at different at governments from city to county to state government. And um, Manager Alleygood, having him with us inside and being able to make real-time decisions without slowing down, very active, uh, great resource uh, and help in that. And I don't want to leave him out in that. He was great to have in. Never had management at that level be side by side with us in making decisions and moving forward. Well, that's why he was hired. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I, I'd like to maybe uh, put on the agenda, or we should put on the agenda for November, uh, where yourself and the Vice Chair, maybe uh, in conjunction with Carney and uh, Brian, uh, maybe put together a study committee uh, to study the Emergency uh, Operational Center. Uh, to, to see whether what improvements can be made, if any, uh, some of the things to look at. You know, we, we lucked out. This could have been a four or five, but I think a lot of prayers were answered uh, because we would have had devastation like we've never seen probably before. Uh, so I, I think I'm going to put your approval. I think I'll add that to the agenda for a discussion and possibly a study group. November. Okay. Yeah, November. Uh, and I also want to thank Connie, you and your staff, the sheriff, <coughs> Coleman, and his staff, Brian, uh, all the first responders, the EMS, the fire departments, it's everybody uh, really uh, stepped up and, and went way beyond. Uh, and thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, I can't resist. I've got to do it. All right. 
there would there would have been a new EMS center had they not killed the facility we were trying to build. That was part of the process. Everybody was hollering about stop the jail, stop the jail, but there was so much other attached to the to that facility that yeah, now we're paying for it. Mr. Chairman, I just can't resist either. I have okay. to have a say. All right. Well, you know, this is a facility that you've used once in three years, two or three years, and, and within 300 feet of it, there's probably a 22,000-foot modern building. There's no reason that you have to have an EMS center sitting there waiting just in case something happens. We have plenty of buildings with, with the five Ps, can be done to give these people the, the facilities that they think they need to do this. I was in the operations center virtually every day, and it was not, well, it wasn't bad conditions, but everybody was close together, but everybody was doing their job, and everybody was being successful, and the management was doing its job, so I'm not going to support a four or five million dollar building that may be used once every three, four or five years. Don't forget, we've been as long as 10 years without a hurricane hitting. And this is what we have these people hired for. Not to sleep, but to be ready when this thing comes and to know where they're going to be go to do it. And again, within 300 feet of where they were, there is a building that will provide all the facilities they will ever, ever need. And it is definitely will not be used during one of these emergencies. So why do you want to go out and spend this money? Any other comment? Uh, thank you, Carney. Thank you, Chris. And thank you to our light switch. <laughs> Commissioner Richardson, thank you for noting that we did not sleep. <laughs> and, and also, thanks to uh, our county manager, manager uh, Brian Allegood. Uh, most of the commissioners had a chance to sit in on the last department head. Uh, on Tuesday at 1 o'clock before Florence was supposed to actually hit the next day. And uh, we did not receive good news that day from uh, Carney. And yes, prayers must have been answered uh, because we did dodge a category four coming up to Pampico River. Uh, we're down a little after seven o'clock, so we get, we're gonna take our break at this point. Uh, and we'll be back in 15 minutes. I thought it was too. Okay, we're down to items for discussion. Uh, item number two is the uh, flood maps update. Uh, Commissioner Richardson. Well, I just asked the manager to provide us with an update. Have, have the proper documents that were supposed to be submitted in September been submitted? Well, I had a conversation, uh, members of the board, I had a conversation with Randy Munt, who is the outreach coordinator for the risk management section of the North Carolina Department of Public Safety. He said that due to the hurricane, they have been put about three weeks behind. Uh, they are hoping to have preliminary map revisions out by the end of October, so the end of this month. There would be a 30-day review period until the end of November with a final letter of determination they hope from FEMA by January of 19 and then the effective date of summer of 19. So. Good news. Thank you. Okay. She's asleep. All right. Item number three is the approval of the uh, jail medical plan. Commissioner Richardson. Well, this at, at the last commissioner's meeting, this this motion was made. Uh, Commissioner Richardson moved that we summon the medical plan for the jail and that we insert in the medical plan that the sheriff shall notify when an inmate is admitted to the hospital uh, and shall notify the appropriate people, the designated people, uh, and Commissioner Brown seconded that motion. The vote was 5 2. Uh, and my question to the manager is Has the sheriff submitted any language having to do with his policy on notifying uh, when a prisoner is taken to, is admitted to a hospital? Um, the letter was written to the sheriff's office, and um, we are waiting on their response. I believe you said the letter would go out the second day after the last meeting. I don't think it went out the second day after last meeting. I had conversation with the chief deputy about it after the meeting, and then I sent them a letter after that, but they have the letter. Yeah. When do you expect to get an answer? Um, that was a question that was asked in the letter, and so I'm not you sure. You have not received a – this is typical of our sheriff. He he keeps telling us he can do what he wants to, and he, so far he's getting away with it. He's doing what he wants to. Now, let, let me mention 
two things here uh, that go on with this. I asked for a copy of the County Detention Center medical plan uh, be presented. It has been presented here. The medic this medical plan has been signed by the sheriff in 10-5 of 17 and by the uh, county health director 10-2, 10-3 of 17. Now, the general statutes in North Carolina say that the medical plan has to be approved by the governing board. I've been here 22 years. I have never seen the medical plan brought before the board for approval. That's neither here nor there because I've seen a whole lot of other things that are supposed to be brought to the commissioners that were never brought to the commissioners. So what I would say to the commissioners is this. There are two issues here. There is the notice to be given when the inmate is admitted to the hospital. And then there's the issue of visitation after that. So I think what we should do tonight is we should go ahead and insert that language. The sheriff's had 30 days to respond. He hasn't responded, which we voted to do. Uh, the, the resolution that I just read said it was going to be inserted in there. Uh, and what it needs to be is two sentences. The first sentence should say that the sheriff shall notify upon the admission to the hospital. And the second sentence needs to say that visitation shall be dependent, contingent upon security conditions that are to be determined by the sheriff. And that covers the problem. So I will make a motion uh, that we insert into this plan that I just gave you the dates of those two sentences and that we approve the entire document which is on page 130 and 131 and then Beaufort County is in compliance with the law because we're not in compliance with the law right now. If, if you will step up there Chief Rice. Um, just I guess before you get to a point where there's a second and discussion and vote um, I've spoken with the sheriff at length you know in reference to the medical plan um, I also spoke to my former sheriff and he doesn't remember the medical plan coming before the board and he was sheriff for 16 years before Sheriff Coleman was um, I have noticed that, that in the statute I, I say that you are accurate in that um, it's, it's the time now that the medical plan is to be drafted um, my recommendation would be or just something to throw to the board would be allow the jail administrator and the health director to draft the plan. You've been provided with a copy of the plan that was signed off in October of 2017. We present the board with a plan and then just like you were mentioning earlier in one of your comments that you know uh, you wait until you actually see the document and then you mark it up and if there's anything to discuss or anything that needs to be added then we can bring it back at another meeting before it's to so it can be approved can we expect language similar to what I just said the two sentences that I just said to be in the plan when it's presented uh, I, believe, I believe that any discussion is on the table when it comes to the, the medical plan well you know the easiest thing for the commissioners to do to get this thing over with is to go ahead and and second the motion that I just made and then the sheriff has the language that goes into the plan when he presents it and if he wants to change that language he is certainly at liberty to change the language but uh, when he presents it in November uh, to November the first meeting uh, that way we avoid all of this go back and forth and maybe it's going to happen and maybe it won't happen and we're waiting on somebody else and I appreciate what you said chief deputy but I think that will will solve our problem that we we vote on the language now it can be changed if the sheriff so desires when he presents uh, the jail medical plan for the approval of the county commissioners so my motion is still there since we have our health uh, department head here uh, I'm assuming that you guys are fairly close to to redoing the medical plan between now and the end of the year yes it's time now for the plan to be drafted after it's drafted by the jail administrator then it's conversations are had with the director of health and uh, it's turned over to him to sign and then after his approval then we can bring it before the board for discussions and 
amendments as needed. Well, are we changing what we just said when the chief deputy said that we would have the new plan at the November meeting? You're stretching it out to the first of the year, Mr. Chairman. I, I'm not stretching it out. I just because this is dated uh, November. No, I'm sorry, October. That as soon as you able we to can do that. I mean, we can send a draft copy. Once it's completed and ready to be signed, we can send a draft copy. But I'm just trying to be uh, as easy going with uh, Commissioner Richardson's uh, wanting to be as open with the public as much as he can and talk about as much of this in public meetings as opposed to discussing things in draft copy between. Well, the plan's not going to change that much because this plan right here is written based upon the language that's in the general statute. So it's not going to be that different. It's not going to be changed that much. So uh, I, I can't see where you're going to be reinventing the wheel with this. We're just inserting a paragraph in here. All right, we have a motion on the floor. Is there a second? If not, it dies. Thank so what, what, what are we going to do now? Does nothing happen at this point in time? What's, what's the remedy for this? this situation because the board has voted to insert this into the plan. We, can we expect that the sheriff is going to honor the wishes of the board in the resolution that was passed by a vote of five to two? And you know, let me say this other thing. The sheriff should have the courage and the guts to appear before this board instead of sending somebody else a second in command. You know, I would like to see Ernie Coleman standing right here talking to us instead of sending somebody that can't really give us a good answer because he doesn't know what Ernie is going to do next. Now, can we, can we expect Sheriff Coleman to honor the wishes of the Board of County Commissioners and have this language in the plan? The Sheriff will present a medical plan. See, he can't answer because he doesn't know what the Sheriff is going to do and the Sheriff doesn't have the courage to come before this board and stand here and tell us, give us an honest, straightforward answer. Politics, politics. This is a terrible situation. It was started by the last sheriff, and this board let him get away with it. I move that this board request that the sheriff appear before the board instead of sending an employee to represent him. Do I get a second? I don't think so, because you guys are covering for the sheriff. Is there a second? I don't think you've got the guts to second it. Not a man on the board. Not a, not not a, a single man on the board. Mr. Chairman? Yes. Can I say a few words? Yes. You know, I used to tell my staff, when you can't get along with one person, maybe it's that person. When you can't get along with a second person or a third person, then it's usually something wrong with the person. Ooh. This is politics, Commissioner Bunn. Yes, it is. This is not the little club. <laughs> <laughs> politics. Yes, politics. Politics. I don't have to answer to anybody. Against, your minions, sure. your employees that reported to you were under your thumb. Let's get into the real world now and stop covering yeah. for the sheriff. When you, when you attack another elected official, it's very unprofessional. And the only no, it's not unprofessional. Can I have the floor? Yeah, you can have it, but you need to start telling the truth, and you need to get in the rest of the world world with the rest of us. Would you, would you please allow him to finish? I talking to a two-year-old. <laughs> um, the medical plan right now meets section 153A-225. Yes, the medical plan is in compliance with the statutes. Okay. No, it's not. And. It is not. It hasn't been approved by this board. No, Again, no, that, Commissioner that, that Buzio, you're yeah. misleading the public. Why are you so benefit? Because you guys are well, lying. Will you, will you let Commissioner Buzio finish, and then I'll go back to you, okay. Mr. Rich. Fair enough. Let him. Mr. Him. Madden, I have a question for you, if I may. In your uh, service expansion business plan, there's a section in here, D, that, that uh, covers the jail health program, correct? And this was presented by the board to the board when? Twenty seventeen? I mean uh yeah, twenty seventeen, twenty sixteen. So in here it talks about the <coughs> expansion plan. Did we approve this expansion plan when it was presented to us back in twenty seventeen? Yes, sir. But to clarify that it's not a medical plan. 
or caused the jail health program. Data program activity proposed February 2016, target date for implementation July 17, and I got a slew of minutes here from 17. It's in those minutes we talk about the, the plan, correct? And we talk about these uh, uh, addition of the appendix. Correct. And um, talks about the addresses, the Beaufort County uh, strategic plan. It talks about the services that will be uh, afforded the uh, the jail, about billing and things like that. Yes. Okay. But it's 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 is it the full plan that includes these five issues? No, sir. Okay. It's not official jail medical plan. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you, sir. All right. Anybody else for Commissioner Richardson? Let him have it. All right. Well, Mr. Chairman, we still haven't settled anything. This thing is just what it was. The same thing that it has been all along is you leave the meeting and nobody knows what is anybody is supposed to do. So what what is going to happen here? When are we going to get the medical plan presented? And is the sheriff going to comply with the wishes of the board when we voted five to two? We just need an answer. We, we do have a medical plan in place. There is a medical plan in place, but I will flat out say that Commissioner Richardson is correct, that I can't find one that has been presented to the board. The only thing that I can do, since I don't have a time machine in my pocket, is to make sure that once the, the draft is put before the board, that it's put before for approval. So you're, you're, you're saying that we're going to have a chance to approve the next yes. one? Yes. Which will be in the November meeting. Is that correct? I, I have no no problem seeing that there will be a, a plan that's presented to the board at the November meeting. And then it'll be the prerogative of the board whether you approve it that night or whether there's some amendments or changes or anything that needs to be made, and then we can do that at the Fair appropriate enough. time. Okay. One more question, if I may. Yes. Will that plan also include the security concerns? Um, I mean, once again, I'm, I, I guess the thing that I've got here is can't, can't we wait to be disappointed in what we see okay. until actually until yeah. we actually see it? See it. Okay. Yeah. You know, um, and and you know, so I'm I'm not trying to be no. anything but truthful on that, and that's to Commissioner Richards' question as well. Well, the sheriff does have, in fairness, the sheriff does have policy that has to do with security and how security is to be handled and who's supposed to do what when which happens in the jail. That's that's already set out. Okay. Thank you, Chief. You're very welcome. And you're excused because I know you have another engagement. All right. We're down to item number five, the Finance Committee update. Uh, Anita. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The Finance Committee did meet on September the 18th um, at 3 o'clock p.m. The members present were Commissioner Langley, Commissioner Grin, and Chairman Waters. Under old business, the committee completed its review of the county purchasing policy. The committee recommendations will be brought to this full board at the November meeting for their approval. Under new business, the travel expenses for the prior three months for the manager and commissioners were reviewed and approved. It just so happened that our auditor, Jeff Best, was on site beginning his field work for the audit, and so I invited him to attend the meeting with me, and he gladly did that. And while he was at the meeting, he let the committee know that his group had completed a big part of the compliance testing at DSS, but they had a little more to do in that area and they were pretty much just getting started with the financial piece of the audit. The dates were determined for the um, quarterly meetings for next year. They are March 19th, June 18th, September 17th, and December 17th. And that's always on a third Tuesday in, in those months. There is one more finance committee meeting this year, which is on December the 18th at 3 o'clock p.m. in this room. Glad to have anyone that wishes to attend join us. Thank you. Thank you. Any, any questions of uh, Anita? All right, we'll move to items for decision. The first one, the water bill adjustment. Uh, Sandra sent me a text and said that she would like to be moved to the November, so she'll be here in November. Uh, Dan, to item number two, the community development block grant. Uh, Brian, are you going to do that? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry. In and out. <laughs> <laughs> um, I see me 
you don't need me to read it again from the public hearing? No. no. Mm -hmm. So what we do is uh, request a motion to close out the grant and also move. All right, we have a motion to second. close it out and a second. Any discussion? All those in favor of the motion, raise your right hand. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, and we've handled item number three, so we're down to item number four, the Agricultural Development and Farmland Preservation Trust Fund uh, grant us, uh, acceptance. Ann? Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Commissioners. The Beaufort Soil and Water Conservation District has been awarded a grant in the amount of $147,855.58 through the North Carolina Agricultural Development and Farmland Preservation Trust Fund. The grant funds will be used to assist a local landowner with the establishment of a perpetual conservation easement on the family's working farm, a farm of approximately 159 acres. The conservation easement will ensure that the farm will forever remain a working farm. The district intends to apply for additional grant funds through the USDA Agricultural Land Easement Program to supplement the purchase price of the conservation easement and to satisfy any required grant match. Through the services of district staff members, the USDA ALE grant, and other fees to be provided by the landowner, Beaufort County will experience no cash outlay associated in acquiring the conservation easement and 100% of the required grant match will be satisfied. The Beaufort Soil and Water Conservation District's Board of Supervisors has approved participation in this grant project and recommends to the Board of County Commissioners that they accept the Agricultural Development and Farmland Preservation Trust Fund Grant Award through the North Carolina Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services contingent upon receipt of a second grant award through the USDA ALE. Okay. Oh, question. Yes. This last part you said that the one is coming from North Carolina and one is coming from USDA, is that correct? Yes, sir. So if you don't get the one from USDA, you don't get the one from uh, North Carolina? Is we could get it, but we will not go through with it. Okay. Mm -hmm. But this is all this is pending, getting those two pieces together. It's pending on getting the second grant. I'll make a motion we approve it. All right. We have a motion. Is there a second? second. Mr. Mr. Chairman, yes. I wonder if, wonder if the maker of the motion would be willing to amend his motion to say that we approve it, uh, uh, provided that there's no expense to the county. You said that already. Yes, sir. She said that. Yeah, but it's not in the motion. What she says goes into the minutes. What you say in the motion becomes law. What I want to do, I want to bind this thing so that it's not going to cost the county any money. And that's all. Well, you can get that opportunity when they come and ask you for some. <laughs> well, but I, we, I will amend the motion. I will amend it. We never need to get to that point. Thank you. Okay. okay. So, all right. We'll <laughs> get a second. We'll a second. I'll second yeah. it if Jerry was not willing to amend his yeah. second. Okay. I second. Huh? All right. With that amendment. <laughs> Thank you. So we don't have to write a check, ain't? Yes, sir. All right. We're good. Will not be. All right. We're good. All, all those in favor of the motion, raise your right hand. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rodney. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Item number five is the request for the presentation of the final audit from the Hospital Authority Board. Commissioner Richards. Well, I just, I, I, I have not seen the audit that was supposedly done before the hospital board was disbanded and disclosed of, so I asked Commissioner Buzio to present that to the board. Uh, I got an email, I think, with the audit in it today, uh, or the final report, which is not really technically an audit, but it's about as close as we can get without spending a lot of money for nothing. Um, actually, I did present a copy uh, way back. In 2017, you did? 2017, yeah. But not to all, I guess, maybe one copy, we had a quick discussion, but I, I'm glad that you got, you got well, it should be there. presented to the board. Yeah. Um, uh, when you were chairman, you did an audit, or not an audit, a financial review. Same kind of a thing. Same, Same. kind of thing, because we didn't want to spend a lot of money. Right. And I think the quote was close to 20000 No, 14000 14. But we had eight, we had 
from 2011. We had about five or six years to yeah, go through. Yeah, it. From September 1st, 2011, August 4th, 2015. Yeah. So the board approved a similar type of financial review for the period of time, August 2015 through uh, November 2017. And uh, they looked at, um, uh, they examined deposits, which was uh, procedure one, and they examined the pot deposits and found them on the check register uh, and matched those to the bank statements and verified that the amounts were correct. Uh, and this was from Wilson Jones and Griffin, I should mention that, CPAs. They examined the checks written for accuracy and related invoices associated with the checks. They looked for any difference in amounts from the invoice and cleared check. Wilson matched the payment on the check with what was on the invoice and the check register. They did not, they did not find any discrepancies. Uh, number three, uh, the foot register for accuracy. We footed the register for any mathematical errors and found none. Procedure four calculated the ending balance. We calculated the ending balance and found a difference of less than $12 from the reconciled balance in the check register and the bank balance. It appears as this amount, this amount is where interest was not recorded in the check register, causing this incorrect amount due to the size of the account. And the amount of this discrepancy was our judgment. This was immaterial, and no additional procedures were done to determine the ending balance. They scanned the general ledger for unusual items. Our scan did not uncover any items that we felt to be unusual or not within the scope of uh, Beaufort County Hospital Authority Board purpose. Procedure six, they scanned each monthly bank statement, canceled checks, and deposit slips for unusual items. No unusual items were noted. Uh, that are not included in other procedures. Those items include unusually large deposits and withdrawals. The procedures we performed did not constitute an audit or a review made in accordance with auditing standards generally accepted to the United States of America, and consequently no assurance is expressed. Had we performed additional procedures, other matters may have come to our attention and would have been reported to you. That's a general statement and everything. Our management is responsible to both the County Hospital Authority's internal control over compliance with policies and procedures developed for these, these matters. The, this report is intended solely for the information and use of the Board of Directors and its management of the Beaufort County Hospital Authority is not intended to be or should not be used by anyone other than these specific uh, uh, parties. And the other thing, we had a CFO uh, who was not a voting member of the Hospital Authority who handled the, the reconciliation, the same as you had. Uh, the process was the attorneys would receive uh, an invoice, or I would receive an invoice. We would pass that on to the attorneys. The attorneys would uh, draft a, 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 a document that had to be signed by the county manager and myself. And that went from the attorneys, went back to the attorneys and went to the bank. The bank cut the checks. And we didn't handle any checks occasionally. Um, so that, that's the, the order, and everybody has the one from 2011. 2015 and the latest from 2015 to 2017. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, item number seven. Uh, good. All, all I was able to write down in haste was Wilmington. Yeah. That's the one you want okay. to add. This is about the federal um, subpoena that was issued by the grand, federal grand jury in Wilmington having to do with uh, uh, illegal voting, with people who should not be voting that were actually voting. And they issued a broad-based subpoena, which I agree with, should, should be uh, skinned down because there's, there's um, uh, for 40-something counties in eastern North Carolina, and it, it appears at first as though what they were wanting was the actual records and the actual ballots and all of this kind of stuff. And the truth of the matter is they can, they can do their job with a lot less information. Now, one of the things that's going on is, number one, this issue hasn't come before these commissioners, and we're one of the counties that received a subpoena. And it should come before the commissioners. What I'm concerned about is, there, there's, I understand from the county attorney, and he's certainly welcome to weigh in on this, uh, that, the, that the Wake County is providing the lead on this. And the lead, here's the direction the lead is going in, to quash the subpoena. Now, I'm against that. There is enough illegal voting going on out there of people who should not be voting uh, that this needs to be investigated. And I think that this board should consider 
a resolution that says we support the we do not support quashing the subpoena we uh, support reconfiguring the subpoena to a practical form and go forward with that because as long as we sit here on our hands these people in wake county are going to lead us down the garden path trying to get this subpoena quashed and the investigation of illegal voting will go away when that happens well i am one of the people and i realize there are a lot of people who say the complete opposite there are a lot of people that are double voting. There's a, there is illegal voting. It needs to be looked at. It needs to be put to rest. So with that, I make the motion that the Beaufort County, the resol as a resolution, that to be sent to Wake County, which is the, apparently the lead agency on this, that Beaufort County does not support quashing the subpoena, that Beaufort County does support reconfiguring the uh, subpoena to a more practical uh, format. All right. David, would you like to comment? Uh, yes, I would. Um, I'll, I'll try to fill in some of the blanks here. This, uh, this, this case was presented to the U.S. District Court, to the grand jury, alleging that certain persons uh, with illegal bogus documents, for whatever reason, had voted in some elections uh, in eastern North Carolina. There were uh, I think it was 45 counties that received the same subpoena that we received. Um, we understand that there were a grand total of 19 arrests made in all of those counties, and those those uh, folks were incar incarcerated. Uh, the subpoena was issued and served on the counties, requiring voluminous voting documents um, and given to September the 25th uh, to uh, turn up those documents, which was an, uh, just an extreme impossibility. Now, we know uh, from, uh, from law school, as a matter of fact, a motion to quash is the only way to test the subpoena, and that was where we ended up in these phone conferences that we had on this thing. There is no other way on the subpoena. So you file a motion to, to quash, and you see whether it is a legal subpoena or not. Um, there, is, there is a good dar argument that it is not, uh, that, that this is contrary, that what they have requested is contrary to North Carolina law, um, and uh, that it would be prohibited by law. So. The thought was that we need to get this before first, before a federal judge uh, who will look at the whole situation and either quash the subpoena completely or if they are able to uh, bring about some type of a, uh, a situation that, that Beaufort County can live with or that all the other 45 counties can live with, um, uh, then we will do so. We've, uh, we've also uh, requested help from the, the state office uh, to help on, with our expensive expenses, which are going to be, uh, if we've got to comply with this subpoena, they're going to be extensive. I have an attorney uh, that I have talked to that we have utilized uh, before. In fact, he's involved in the uh, NAACP uh, litigation. And I've talked to him about uh, the possibility of assisting us uh, in this thing. I have not retained him. I've just talked to him about it. Um, and uh, before we make that move, uh, if we're going to make that move, then we'll come back to the board and talk to you about it. Uh, it's my opinion that we go along with this motion um, and and have have the subpoena tested. I think it's uh, I think it's it's a wrong move just to cave in the subpoena and start producing documents. And we may be, and if we did that, we might be the only county that's doing that. Quite frankly, now there may be others, but uh, what I know right now, we may be the only one that's not uh, going this route. Well, you know, if everybody's jumping off the bridge, you're going to jump off the bridge too. You know, there's illegal voting going on out there, and that needs to be investigated. And this is as good an opportunity as you'll ever get to do that. 
I don't have a problem if you want to reword what I just said to say this is the Beaufort County strategy in this. But we need to make our wishes known if you want to see illegal voting properly investigated and the people that are doing it put in jail. But if you sit here and go to quash the subpoena, if they totally quash the subpoena and it doesn't exist anymore, then there is no negotiating. And it, it is important, I think, for Beaufort County to take the lead. We can say this is our strategy if you want to do a resolution that says this is our strategy. I'm going to follow our attorney. Well, I'm pretty sure the Democrats are all against this. Well, it ain't a no Democrat thing, but you ain't no lawyer. Well, this is not this is not a Democrat Republican issue. I've I've assumed based on what I've read and what I've heard is that there's even if that subpoena is done away with, they're gonna come back with uh still with an investigation. I think the the investigation is continuing. Yes. Uh, I think this was just a step they the, that they took. So uh, this is not a lawsuit. It's only a subpoena that was issued by the, by the grand jury, federal grand jury. So there is no lawsuit yet. It's going to cost thousands but of dollars. There has been an order issued that no records be deleted or destroyed that we're operating under, under the Board of Election. That they not be destroyed. Not be destroyed. Exactly. Mr. Chairman. Yes. Uh, 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 can, uh, Mr. Francisco, if, if, if these subpoenas go through and we have to provide all those records, that is a considerable, considerable amount of time, money, and effort, isn't it? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And we're putting that information together. Uh, that's, we're, we're taking that precaution, on the other hand to start looking at that and figure out how many documents are going to be involved. Thousands. It's anticipated that there's going to be an argument before the judge on this motion, uh, and he needs to know how many total documents. Thank you. Wake County alone had over a million documents to produce. And we're talking about multiple years. From what I have read, we're talking about going back multiple and, and years. Either, even both counties is in the thousands. That, that's what I was thinking. Mm -hmm. And even at that, it's going to cost thousands and thousands of dollars just to duplicate those records. Is that correct? If we have to do it. Thank you. Could you repeat your motion? Uh, my motion is, I mean, we can do this as a strategy. Let's say my motion is that the Beaufort County strategy on this issue is not to quash the subpoena, but to reconfigure the subpoena request to a so that a reasonable amount of information can be presented and still accomplish what the grand jury wants accomplished. That's not exactly what I said before, but that's close. Well, and, and to some actions taken, we're not even sure that any information. I th it, here again, some of the reading I've had is that the state is saying some of this information that they're asking for, uh, state statute does not allow them to have it. I mean, it's confidential information. I believe that's true. Confidential. Yeah, you can always subpoena confidential information. The state can argue that all they want to, but if, if you've got the information, it doesn't matter how confidential it is, it can still be subpoenaed. Mr. Chairman, the, yes. the, the subpoena is to the custodian of the records, and that is the Beaufort County Board of Elections. That's but we're going to pay the bill, so you we are, have a say. You, you are going to pay the bill, but you're not the custodian of the records, so you would need to separate, I would think, the two. Because if the board wants to make a broad statement that this is how they feel about it, I think the board should do that. But the board is not the custodian of the Oh, board. I agreed. I don't have a problem with that. I mean, I think you're right on target. I, I never intended to, to, to involve the, uh, the board of elections in it, but the, but the will of the board, because we are going to pay that bill. You, the taxpayer, are going to pay that bill. So he who got the goal makes the rules. So, but I feel like illegal voting should be investigated. And I would agree with you on that, illegal voting. Anyhow, no, be. but the amount of information... But how we get there? Yeah. Because I see what Brian's saying, we have to be extremely careful. We don't step into the middle of something. We both get sued. 
I think the concern that the elections director has expressed is that they have asked for election ballots, and those ballots that they've asked for can be directly traced back to the voter. And there is a concern from the Board of Elections that when you open that box and you start saying, you voted this way and you voted this way, gotcha. that it goes against the fundamental bedrock of our elections, and that's their concern. I agree, and I, I don't see why they need actual ballots. They should be looking at voter rolls and voter registrations and cross-comparing those kinds of things. I don't think they need the ballots, in my opinion, to do what they say they want to do. And I think that's why they have asked to, to try to quash the subpoena to get it more in alignment with what it should be. That's right. Right. And, and I, that's all we're saying is this is what our position is. So the only question, if I understand it, and it has to do with the amount of material, can you, do, can you, get, can you get the information out of the less records that, that do not break federal law? Is that what it is? I think right now, and again, the, the county attorney has expressed that, 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 that what the subpoena is asking for is a whole bunch of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And From all 45 counties. Right. <laughs> millions so and millions. They're trying to narrow that scope, and the way you narrow that scope is to quash the subpoena and have them come back. So is, is your advice that we leave this alone for now? I would leave it alone for now. That would be my advice. And let's I'll try to tell you. We, we have to get it before the court so that, that someone else can look at the subpoena. And if they want to pare it down, then they can, they can withdraw the subpoena and reissue a subpoena, for instance. So the court can say, we're going to quash this subpoena. But it's the only way to test it. That's, that's all that's going on here is a subpoena. And the motion to quash is the only way to test it. But for a settlement of the suit, you're going before a judge, and it's no different than any other case that goes before a judge. It can be negotiated and settled before it gets to the judge if you have people who are saying the proper things. And that's what I'm trying to get us to do is to say we really don't want to kill the subpoena. We, are, we think it should be negotiated to more reasonable terms. If you can negotiate those terms before it gets in the judge, in front of the judge, then you just present it to the judge and he approves it. So, you know, unless somebody takes the initiative on this to say, we want illegal voting investigated, but your request is is too harsh and it needs to be muted and redone, that's all that I would like for this board to do, right. is to say that. So what is wrong with that? Not a we are entitled to our opinion. You are you're entitled to your opinion. No, the board's entitled to its opinion, well, too. Well, my opinion is to follow the advice of the attorney and not the surveyor. Yes. Can I ask a county attorney? Will? Yes, you sure can. Is any county fighting the issue that they don't want to open up their books because, and they don't want to investigate illegal voting if there is any? Or are they fighting the subpoena because it's too broad? Too broad. It's, uh, I would say, overall, because it's, the subpoena is too broad. Too and broad. Now, that's not to say that, that all the counties uh, agree, okay. uh, but, but all that were involved in the phone conferences, which were, we had a roll call, it was 30, 33 or 34 counties out of 44 that, that was together on the first phone call, first uh, phone conference uh, that were involved. And they seem to be pretty much okay. the one boys. Let me ask you one more question of clarification. My understanding in the past has always been once a subpoena is issued, there's no negotiation to subpoena unless the judge rules it, throws it out, and then you start over again. They could withdraw the subpoena. Withdraw, but, yeah. Yeah. but usually there's no negotiation on it. Well, that's correct. Yeah. A subpoena is a subpoena. The only way to, to test it is, is a motion to quash. That's right. And the negotiation is we'll withdraw the subpoena and we will resubmit that for this, providing all you guys don't challenge it. That's the negotiation. That can be done. Everything is negotiable. Me and Donald Trump, we can negotiate anything. I believe that. I don't, I don't think yeah. subpoena. I believe that. I don't, I don't, I don't, I'm not disagreeing with what you want to do, but I don't know. I think it has to go to the court for the court to decide. Then if they squash it, then you can start negotiation with the U.S. Attorney. Or the grand sure. jury. How do you, well, 
Really, the U.S. Attorney. I would agree with that. Okay, we got a motion on the floor. Is there any more discussion? Is there a second? Okay, the motion dies. I don't dies. disagree with you. Well, all right. The next uh, item on the agenda is a closed session, and I'll ask um, Katie. <laughs> a motion is needed to go to closed session under NCDS 143-3, 1184, to discuss matters relating to the location or expansion of industries or other businesses in the area served by public body, including agreements on alternative lists of economic development incentives that may be offered by the public body of negotiation, and also under NCGS 143-3, to establish or to instruct the public body staff or negotiating agents concerning the position of the by or on behalf of the public body and negotiate the price of other than the real terms of the contract or proposed contract for the acquisition of real property by purchase, option, exchange, or lease, or the amount of compensation and other material terms of an employment contract or proposed employment contract. You did it. Okay. Yeah. Is there a motion to go into closed so move. session? Motion. Is there a second? Second. Yeah. All right. All those in favor, raise your right hand. All right. Do we have to make a motion to allow it? Okay. We're, we uh, have come out of uh, closed <laughs> session and we will take no action. Uh, and this time I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. So move. Motion is there a second. Stand so, up. Second. All those in favor, stand up. <laughs>